do a quick sound check. So if you can hear my voice, please type in a Y. All right, there we go. Loud and clear right off the bat. Looks like uh, we had a minimal delay in the audio video feed here. Just want to say thank you very much, everybody, for your time in advance. Um, next week is a pretty big one for the U.S. dollar. So Monday is a holiday here in the United States in observance of Memorial Day. But after that, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, we have high impact data on the calendar for the U.S. dollar each day of the week. Uh, the week closes with non-farm payrolls and ISM. So we have a pretty interesting backdrop to see some USD volatility. Uh, price action has been pretty interesting in its own right this week. We saw U.S. dollar rally up to resistance yesterday around FOMC minutes, started to pull back, have a little bit of that to work with right now. So we're going to go over that and quite a bit more today. But as usual, this webinar is all about you. So questions you have or pairs you want to take a look at, please don't hesitate to type those in the chat box. I'll do my best to answer those when we get to the Q&A portion of today's webinar. I need to go through a couple of quick risk disclaimers, and then we'll get right onto the charts, uh, starting right here. Trading is risky. I'm going to give this about 10 more seconds, and then we'll proceed. All right. Number two, hypothetical trading disclaimer. We're going to look at some past trades. We're going to look at some strategy. Anytime we do so, we have to know past performance is not indicative of future results. All right. Now let's make this happen. One second. There we go. All right. So as mentioned, price action this week has been really very interesting uh, because we have started to see that bullish trend slow down a little bit more here. Right. We started surging about a month ago, a little over a month ago now. We had this evening start that printed up last week, led to a bit of a retracement. But then we just chugged higher from there. We ran right into this resistance zone yesterday, just ahead of FOMSI minutes. And the way that this came in was really very interesting. As you can see that prices went right up to that level just ahead of the release of those FOMC minutes that took place at 2 p.m. right in here. And then we've had a drop take place thereafter. Since then, it's been a continuation of lower lows and lower highs. So there is some bearish structure to work with here on a shorter term basis. Although that intermediate term move remains bullish in nature, we've seen a mere 23.6% pullback on this recent move. And then if we go out longer term, daily and above, that's where we have that longer term area of resistance, that little chunky zone in here. Now we looked at this on Tuesday. This is a pretty interesting area for me because it's confluent. We have two different 38.2% retracements right in here within like 11 points or 0.11 points of, of difference here on DXY. The 38.2% retracement of this major move, the 2014 to 2017 major move, 38.2 comes in at 94.30. Now, that was a big level last year, and we'll get into that here in a moment. But the retracement move that showed, taking last year's high down to this year's low, the 38.2 of that move comes in at 94 spot 19. So, again, really attractive area of confluence that's in there. When we were working with this 94.30 level last year, see where this helped us get the August swing high right there? help produce this swing high in early October, and then it helped produce this swing high. That was kind of the last stop before we went into that capitulation move that rolled into the beginning of this year. Now we're back. The big question is if we're going to get some kind of action like we had back here, if it's going to actually give us a top or give us a reversal. And that possibility remains, especially as we go into a week as we have next week. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, heavy week of USD data. Give me a quick moment. I'm going to get the calendar set up for you. All right, so we're just looking at the calendar for this week. Let's go to next week. Filter this out. USD high impact only. It's pretty big, right? We have US consumer confidence Tuesday morning. Uh, GDP Wednesday morning. Advanced trade good balance. PPI also Wednesday morning. PCE. Now, this is a big one because this is the Fed's preferred inflation gauge. Uh, and then we close off the week, like I said earlier, NFP, ISM. So there's a lot to work with here. If we are going to see a big turn in the dollar, the, the backdrop here can produce that. 
we are in that situation where we could see a reversal or we could see a surge to that resistance, really depending on the way that this data rolls out. So I think we need to go into next week fully prepared for that. The fact that we do have the dollar at an interesting spot, case we made on the long or the short side, and we have a ton of drivers that could hasten or reverse any of those themes. I know it's as clear as a, <laughs> as a puddle of mud, as we say in Texas, but that's okay. We're going to look at a series of setups on either side of this scenario so that whichever way it rolls, we have something to work with. Let's go back to the chart. Back to the chart, kind of like uh, getting back to the default view, at least for me. Okay, so again, longer term, the most attractive setup to me here is, is short. Looking for a reversal of this recent strength after a 38.2% retracement of that bearish move. Getting down to an intermediate term basis, I got to look at this bullish because we have higher highs, higher lows. We have not yet seen traders take out that prior swing low that we have at 93 spot 30. If you remember, we were looking at resistance 93 spot 35, so I'd color that up, call it a zone. If we do get that break below 93.30, 93, that's when this intermediate term begins to mesh with that longer term view. And on a hyper short term view, so I'm talking like sub hourly, we need to go down to like the 15 minute or less. Then we could work with some bearish momentum in here. OK, so again, it's pretty coagulated. There's a few different ways to look at this right now, uh, but we're going to cut through this in today's webinar. All right, your dollar. So this is one of the setups that we've been following uh, for a couple of different things. Now, last week I had lined this up as one of my FX setups for last week. And I was looking for a hit on 120, which we got. And then we had a continuation run that came right down into this really big zone of support. Now, this is an area of support that had played in a few different instances last year. You can see here in August. Right. And so we had a really overbought uptrend at the time. This was a big zone in the fact that it, it stemmed that retracement and it did it a couple of different times. Right. We popped back up in September. And then we came right back down to support. We didn't actually break through support until the ECB extended QE into 2018. You know, so a pretty big negative factor there for the euro. And it gave us a mere support break, quick hit of resistance on the underside of that zone. And then we were just right back above two weeks later. That driver two weeks later was German GDP, somewhat of a similar image or a, a, a similar comp to what we have coming up this week on the U.S. dollar, where there's just a ton of data. And if we get one of these outlier reports that catches a lot of attention, it's totally possible that, say, a blowout PCE reading elicits a really big run of dollar strength. That German GDP report, it was a game changer. Popped us back above that support zone, support again, support again in December, and then this thing went into launch. Uh, now we're right back down there. We've been playing with this area for most of this week. Notice we first started to intersect. Um, this is on Monday. It gave us a quick bounce up to 1825. That could not hold. So we went right down to the bottom portion of that zone. And right now you can see we're catching some intraday resistance right on that 16 or excuse me, 1736 level. So I'd be hard pressed to call this bullish right now. I'd be hard pressed to look at this for bearish continuation at this point. I would normally love the idea of selling off of a level like we have here, prior level of support, big area of longer term, uh, well, what has been longer term support. And then I got these wicks up here to, to cover it. What I don't like about that is the fact that we've seen some rather rigid higher lows printing in after that hit to long-term support. So I think this thing might have a deeper retracement before it's ready to run lower. Uh, this trend line right in here is a level of interest for me. And I'm basically just taking that off of the recent run. There we go. It started back in April. One point of connection so far. So I wouldn't consider this a great trend line. What I like about it though is it's an area where I could see prices catch to a lower high so that I could look to get a stop above that 18 and a quarter area. Okay, so I need that one to develop a little bit more before I'd be able to do anything with it. I have the fear that this thing might run for a little while longer and I don't wanna press anything too hard right now. And largely because we are at that longer term area of support, right? I don't have enough evidence to suggest that this is good for a long. I also don't have enough evidence to suggest that there's a lot of juice in the squeeze underneath this zone of support. So, when that's the case, I wait. Now, what could get this bullish? 
So for those that do want to press the bullish theme, and I'd written about this earlier this morning, there could be a case to be made on really short time frames. Given that we do have this continuation of higher lows, we just came off of a recent higher high, we're breaking back above that 1736 level like right now. What I could look at is a continued break here above 1750 to then trigger a bullish stance with which I could look for a pullback down here to 1736 in the effort of getting my stop down here below 17. That way, if this does turn out to be a bear flag, if this thing does break down, I could get out of there really quick. I don't have to hang around to pay to see how wrong I might have been. Uh, but that's what I'm looking at in Euro dollar. Pound dollar's got a very similar look at the moment. I mean, both of these are in the midst of, or have been in the midst of some very exasperated moves. Uh, the thing that is different to my eyes between cable and Euro right now, I'm not as big a fan of the support zone that's coming in. Like if you remember when we were looking at that Euro set, that support zone had held in August, September, December, it was really well worn of support. The zone that I'm looking at in cable, this is the same that we've been following. I take it off this swing high in August. We got some good price action here in October, and this was that launch point in December. So there's some, some similarity there, but I'm not, a, a, not as big a fan of this support zone as I am as the one that we have on Euro. So if I had my druthers, I got to play a reversal. I like that support zone on the Euro better than I like what we have in cable. Uh, but with that being said, the shorter term we get, we're going to see more and more signs of exasperation in this short side move that started just about a month ago. Let's go down a little tighter. There we go. Hourly chart. Okay, so what I mean by exasperation, we were down at this 135 level for so long. I mean, this is, and this is why I'll, a cable like Pac-Man is just eating up these negative drivers and it's just back and forth, 135, 135, 135. And we started a breach earlier this week and that was on news that Nicola Sturgeon might be kicking up another Scottish independence referendum. So more drama on the Brexit front. And that makes sense. It's been a fairly negative driver for cable whenever one of these issues would pop up. The big question is how are we going to recover or if we're going to recover or if it's going to send the, 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 the currency back into a tailspin. But it led into a really clean move down to that support zone earlier this week. And this one just smells like a bear trap to me. We pop back up. We got some resistance off of prior support right around that 3411 swing, 3415, 3411 up to 34 and a quarter. Um, you know, so again, normally I'd be looking at this for a short side set, looking for a retest of those lows at 33.21, maybe even a secondary target down to 32 and a, and a half. Uh, this one just smells like a trap to me. We saw a ton of resistance in here at that level. I'm on an hourly chart. Notice where we were just grinding at that level for most of the morning. And it looked like it was going to play out. But then we saw buyers come in, support prior resistance. Again, I think this thing's going to, move back up for a deeper resistance test. So not looking to press the short side of this just yet. What could get this long? So my litmus for getting long here is going to be higher than it is in the euro because we do have such a confluence of negative factors around the UK at the moment. Um, of course, there's case to be made around uh, a hastening in the, in the negativity around the eurozone given what's happening in Italy. But uh, with where we're at right now, I would need to see a sustained break back above, not only 135, I'd probably see, want to see a break above 135.30 so that I could then look to try to get some higher low support off that 34.78.35 zone. So this one has some work to do before I'd be able to look at buying it. But I do think near term, we're going to see a continuation of some of the short term bullish momentum. And, and I don't want to trifle with short positions just yet. Okay, one pair that is not flummoxed by indecision. It's dollar yen. We had a little bit more, uh, shall we say, geopolitical drama pop up today. Um, and, and you can see where that's really, really hitting the yen here. So this has been a pretty interesting trade for me over the past week. Uh, I set this up. This was another one of my FX setups for last week. My final target was 111.50. We came 10 pips away and then it came right back down. Um, but I got two out of those three targets. And then I was looking for some continuation earlier this morning, and I'd drawn up this zone right in here. Let me go down to a shorter chart so I can show you where that comes from. There we go. All right, so there's that top side run from last week. I mean, notice it was pronounced. It was clean. It was rather one-sided. Nary a pullback as it was surging. 
And this week we've had an about face. This thing is flipped, it's turned, and near-term price action has been very, very aggressive to the downside. Now the support zone that I was looking at, I'm essentially taken from two different things. Uh, 109.20 or 109.19 is a Fibonacci retracement, the 38.2 retracement of this major move. Right in there, 2015 top, 2016 bottom, 38.2, right in there. 108.62, I'm essentially just taking from this swing low right in here that syncs up pretty well with some prior candle bodies, little little area of support back there in, in uh, latter April. So at this stage, see on the four hour chart, we just started to see that support test. At this point, I need to confirm that it might actually hold so that I could look to get long. There is a case made on the short side of this though, given the veracity with which that move has went off. So for those that are looking at taking a short, uh, short stance in dollar yen, the backdrop is there as well. I'm looking at this for top side, but that doesn't mean you have to look at, look at it the same way that I do. Uh, let me first go over the, the, the bullish approach, and then I'll show you the short side approach that I'm not looking to work with right now. Okay, so on the bullish approach, if we just go down to the hourly chart, notice we've got these lower lows, lower highs, lower lows, lower highs, good little area of resistance off that trend line projection. And at this point, we're just bouncing off of a fresh low, maybe even about to catch some resistance off this prior batch of swings right in here. What I need to see to be able to get long dollar yen again, I need to see it break that chain. 109.75 is the level of interest. So what I'd be looking for there is another test of 110 to break above this quick swing high, thereby showing me we have a higher high. Now it's time to look for the higher low. And as long as that higher low stays above this point, around 108.95, then I could look for top side with a move back towards some of these prior swing points like 110.60, 111, maybe even 111.50 this time if uh, if it has the juice to, to, to pose that 10 pip breakout. Um, but that's the side of this that I'm looking at. Now the short side of the move be short term in nature, five minute chart, and you'd basically wanna see some element to the fence below 109 and a half. Okay, notice when this thing was breaking down, we just got a little bit of support here about 109.40 and that popped us up to this 109.50 level. As long as we stay below that swing high, the door remains open for short side continuation. Looking for a deeper test within that zone, maybe even as deep down to 108.62. Now with that being said, and the reason, one of the reasons that I'm looking at this with a bullish bias as opposed to a bearish bias is because I think if I am gonna look for yin strength right now, there are more interesting places to do it. And this is something we've been talking about for a little while now. When we have this surge or this, this, this very thematic move in the US dollar, we gotta try to pick our battles, right? So we have a really stretched US dollar. If we have a really stretched US dollar and a really stretched Japanese yen, me looking for a reversal there is basically betting on two different things to change. I, I, try, I wanna try to avoid that if at all possible. If we're seeing simultaneous dollar strength and some element of yen strength, and I'm looking for both of those to reverse or to flip, in my opinion, I think I have a lower probability of guessing both of those than I do any other one thing. So for yen strength, I'm going to look euro yen, pound yen. Uh, those are still the pairs that uh, are on my blotter. Speaking of which, let's just go ahead and cut to the chase. Euro yen. All right, so we looked at this one on Tuesday, and we've seen some continued breakdown in here, and I like that. It's working pretty well so far. Um, we've seen a little bit of support pipe in shy of this prior swing around 127.50, but see, fresh 2018 lows printed in this morning, and this came right after we had that resistance hit at the underside of that big zone we've been following. So I'm keeping the door open for short side continuation here. I needed to pop back up so that I get a better fill in the effort of getting my stop above that 130 cycle level. Uh, that's the area that's pretty interesting to me right now. It's a little bit jumpy, but there also might be something to work with here around 129. Like I gotta go down to the hourly to start getting that. But if you see the way that this thing came in, that a little bounce 129.66 continuation, just real messy up here on the resistance side of this. So I don't know which point would be most operative. And I don't have it really linking up with anything of prior support. So it makes it a little bit more challenging. Uh, the prior support point that I have appears all the way up at 129.50. So 
I would need this thing to, to, to put in a little bit more uh, retracement before I'd be able to leg anything on the short side here. On a really short term basis, there may be something to work with. But again, this is likely going to be a pretty volatile kind of thing as we're just coming off some fresh. Well, I guess we'd have like, what, five month lows now. And there's just two points of touch on this, so. Not a great trend line by any stretch of the imagination, but I love the move that's been put in. I like the idea that there could be more, especially if we see a hastening in this drama around North Korea. Um, I, you know, I, I don't think we're going to get to nuclear standoff stage, but, um, you know, there's 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 certainly been an impact this this played through here in the end this week uh, around that whole ordeal. So. Until those tensions are removed, I think that the yen is going to be bid. And rather than pushing that against the U.S. dollar that has been really strong in its own right, I want to look for that in an area like euro or even over in the British pound. So this is one that I've been following quite a bit. Had another fill on this yesterday. Uh, give me a quick second. I got an article for you that will explain that setup in a little more detail. So I just had the first target from that setup taken out uh, earlier this morning at 146. Got another target remaining at 145. Putting that article in the chat box right now. There we go. And when we looked at this on Tuesday, we were still in this bear flag formation. And I was basically looking at this bearish sub 150. Uh, really big red bar came in yesterday. And this is the level that I'm going to want you to focus on 146.65. It's the 14.4% retracement of that February sell off. Now that February sell off produced this Fibonacci retracement, which has been really, really very strong. Um, if you remember that 150.80 level, I caught a few good trades off of that back in April, decent element of support strong element of resistance, uh, both of which led into continuation moves. When we broke down, we saw some more work around that 149.42 price. That's 38.2 of that same move. The 23.6 down here, 147.71. That helped out on a couple of different occasions. And now we've broken down past that 14.4% retracement. And again, kind of the same thing, fresh multi-month lows down here. Uh, at this point, I want to see this thing wiggle back up to that 146.65 level. So we just broke down to that new low, thereby taking out the support side of this short-term range. So naturally, a lot of folks, when they see that range play at the bottom of a move, they say, oh, well, I'll just look for price to go back to resistance. Here's my fear. We went down and we probably triggered a few more stops by breaking through that 146 level. And not only that, that range expanded down here. If we come back up for another test of resistance, I have the fear that it won't hold that time. Maybe we have, you know, more buyers after we had the support break. Maybe any other litany of factors comes up there. What I want to see is it move towards resistance, but I don't want it to approach that prior swing at 147.26. Uh, 146.65 seems like a pretty comfortable area. Go down on the 15-minute chart. We can see where this had a little bit of play on short-term sets. See there, a 15-minute chart, decent little support, decent little resistance. If we get back up there, that keeps the door open for a stop above that swing, and then I could look for this to come back down to that 146, then eventually 145. 145 is what helped mark that February low. That's why I'm uh, very focused on that level right now in pound yen. All right, I see a lot of questions for Swissy. I like that. I like that a lot because this pair is – looking very clean to me right now. All right. Let's start off here off the forward chart. I thought I had something a little more interesting. Yeah, this could suffice. All right. So the past month has seen a really consistent trend play out in dollar Swiss. I mean, so clean all the way up, broke above parity. I mean, parity didn't even slow this thing down. We ran all the way up to this level. It's 23.6% Fibonacci retracement of a two-year move right in here, right? Taking that uh, May 2015 low, drawing that up to the December 2016 high, 
23.6 is right there at 10044. And you can see weekly where we tried to take that out two different occasions, could not hold, could not do it, came right back down. Now, when I look at this on the daily, eh, let's go down, four hour. When I look at this on the four hour, you can almost see that, that visual representation of this thing flipping over or keeling over. Um, again, strong, steady trend all the way up, run into resistance. We range around, start to dip the toe in the water. That's a little bit cold. We'll go back out. And then right back in, and then here comes the selling. It's like doing a cannonball right there. I wouldn't say cannonball. We get down to the 50 fib, and then we got the cannonball. At this point, it's kind of like waist deep. But the prospect of retracement is there. Uh, what I'm using to base this approach, that parity level, um, as long as this stays below parity, I'm going to keep the door open for short side continuation in this move. And I think this could come from a couple of different things, but I'm largely going to look at this as a dollar proxy because frankly, I don't know what's going on behind the Swiss National Bank right now for a move this clean to have developed. I'm not going to be that that tinfoil hat guy out there saying, oh, the S&B did it, the, the Swiss National Bank did it, but something was going on that I don't understand or know about. So the fact that it's starting to come in in a similarly clean manner, I'm just going to focus on what I do know is going on here, the U.S. dollar. U.S. dollar was surging. It's put in a clean trend. U.S. dollar started to pull back. It started to show trending possibilities here. Going down a little tighter hourly chart. There we go. Now is where it starts to look pretty bearish. We just spiked down to this low after a quick reversal. That was, yeah, that was yesterday around FOMSI, FOMSI minutes. This thing turned over again. But uh, I'm keeping that on the short side of the radar, at least for the time being. Aussie. All right. I've been following Aussie for USD weakness as well. And I think this one's starting to fill in, looking a bit more attractive here. A bit more attractive. I'm basically taking that, just trying to read the tea leaves of the bullish structure that started to show. Now, when we looked at this on Tuesday, we just come off this area of resistance 76. I didn't like that. But we did come right back down to the support zone that I was looking for, 75 flat up to 75.21. Notice where we get a couple of different wicks here on the four-hour chart. And then we put in a bounce. So door remains open for bullish continuation on this one for me. Uh, and this is probably going to remain as one of the more attractive short dollar candidates on my radar for the near term. Targets, I'm, I'm, I'm still troubled to look for targets beyond 7650, 7680. Um, you know, the kind of the best recommendation or the best strategy that I've ever heard or come across or something like that is... Uh, plan to take off, at, or I'm planning to take off at least half my lot if and when we get up here. If and when we get up here, half the lot comes off, stop to break even on the rest, and if we can get through, great. But if not, uh, I might even trail that stop down and take it, take up the rest like 76.25 or something like that. You know that old saying, be careful as to who you're mean to on the way up because they're going to be there on the way down. It's kind of like that with support and resistance in a, in a market. Um, you know, when you get one of these moves, it's real fast. There's just not a lot of support to work with on the way. So you have to draw back some of these prior support points to get an idea for where new or fresh resistance might come in. And and when it does ultimately come in, it can get pretty nasty because you not only have resistance, you have folks that had bought off the dip looking to close. And then you also have new folks that are looking to trade that prior trend, you know, given how strong that initial move was, it didn't really produce any swing highs on the way down. So it's still going to remain bullish here, looking at this as a short dollar candidate, but uh, don't want to get too greedy beyond 76.50, 76.80. All right, so Kiwi dollar was the one that I was following for dollar weakness. Well, the one that I am still following for dollar weakness, but this thing has just gotten so sloppy on a shorter term basis, and I'm having a, a hard time uh, figuring out what I should do here. Um, again, you know, kind of like we have in a lot of these majors, just in case we made on either side of this thing right now, but. The more interesting aspect of this whole thing is longer term in nature, at least to me. 
Uh, weekly chart, we still have that range going. We just started to work with the support side of this range, and that's why I'm a little bit uncertain of, uh, as to how to proceed on a shorter term basis right now. Because I don't know if we're going to get a deeper drive within this zone before the range wants to fill in, or if we're just going to get a touch and go kind of thing where over the next couple of weeks we're going to see strength come back. Um, now, on that longer term view, a little easier. I just take 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 my time, be patient, wait for price to break back above 70 uh, to start looking for a return towards that 72 then 73.35 area. But again, once I get down here on the daily chart, it it it's pretty messy. So we had this rally. It looked like it was going to be good for a 70 break range fill up towards that 72, 73.35 area. But then we came right back down. We tested this prior swing low. And we're just kind of holding in a state of inertia right now. Looking at this off the hourly, I'd probably want to look at it with a short vantage point. Whereas looking on the four hour above, I'd want to look at it with a long reversal vantage point. So this one, I'm probably just going to have to wait, see the way the prices fill in in the early portion of next week. And uh, it's going to stay on the radar. If we do get that dollar reversal playing out, then this is going to be one of my one of my favorite ponies, I think at least from where I'm at now. Uh, all right, that's what I have in currency land. Wanted to look at a couple of equity indices. All right, Dow Jones Industrial Average. This is in a pretty interesting spot right now. Um, you can see where this has been swinging around as well with, with some of, the, uh, some of the, the Washington drama, shall we say. We even put in a quick breach of that 24,630 level that's been holding the lows. Been doing a pretty good job of holding the lows um, over the last couple of weeks. Near term price action, I don't have anything great. Um, I got to scroll out and and really kind of focus here to try to find anything outside of the, the near term slop that we have. Uh, what I'm looking for is what happens at 25 next. Notice where we just barely squeaked up to that fresh high. We looked at this gap on Tuesday. That gap filled in really, really quickly. Um, and I say really, really quickly, it's largely around the close on Tuesday. But that gap filled in. We came right back down to 24,630 support. But now we have these lower highs. We have this lower low still well above that prior point of support. So, again, I'm in a mixed spot. If I'm in a mixed spot, I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to wait wait for it to clean up. Now, if we do break above this swing high at 25076, I'd even probably color that up to 251. So if we get a break above 251, then that's where I can get a bit more optimistic about a run towards some of these deeper levels, like a 25250, 25 uh let's go back. Uh 25250, 25370 and then we have this swing right over in here that was the swing high from uh late February. It's 25,800. I mean, that's that's a ways away. But on the daily chart, it's kind of showing me hold back and nothing right now. I need that top side break before I'm able to get long. Uh, there's a short side set here too, though. You know, especially given that we just pierced down to this quick low and rallied right back. Um, uh, what I would probably want to see here is I probably want to see price get back below this 23.6% retracement, 24,522. Probably call that 24,500. Um, at which point I could then start looking at uh, a little bit more deeply at reversal potential here in U.S. equities. I'm not in that spot yet. I do think that we could get, you know, panic or, you know, one of those one of those risk aversion runs that's going to come right back. But, you know, I think if we scroll out and we look at this thing on a bigger picture, we've largely stabilized after the chaos in Q1. Now, that's not to say that it can't revert or come back, but at this point, I think we have to keep in mind the topside breakout that happened in early May and the fact that we are still holding some of those higher low support points, um, which is just another reason that if I'm going to get short, that bar is going to be higher. I need to see a deeper break to even give me the idea that something might, might take place there. All right, I'm going to close with the S&P. Kind of the same thing, but I like this. I like the formation here quite a bit better. Um, go here on a four-hour chart. There we go. And that's why I like it better. It's been a lot cleaner. Support is held at around 2705. Resistance is held around 2737, 2750. Um, so I already know what my prerogative is. Downside break below this fib at 2697. 
short side. Uh, top side break above this fib, 2741, bullish. Uh, and, and targets are just going to be based off of prior prior price action points of swing. So like 2760 has a quick little swing up here. We got another swing right up here, 27 and three quarters. Uh, this zone right in here is where I'd want my final target to be. This is the 764786 expanse of that February sell-off right in there. Notice this is also what caught the March swing high in the S&P 500. Uh, the short side is actually going to be a little easier to work with on the target side just because of how much uh, grind and gyration we had down here last month, last three months. Um, so if I do get entered into that short side set right down here, 2662, 2665 was a level that had helped us catch this low uh, earlier in May, but that becomes target one. And that, my friends, is what I have for today. I want to see what kind of questions you ladies and gentlemen have. Please don't hesitate to ask me anything trading related. All right, William O'Keefe. Uh, good afternoon, James. My stinking thinking made me take a loss, but as a trader, that happens to the best of us. Uh, traders and Aussie Cad. Love you, brother. I'm straight. All about the ladies, bro. <laughs> it's all good, my man. It's all good. LDHF. All LDHF. The love is reciprocal. The love is reciprocal. Um, here's here's something here's something to think about. You know, think of a, a trading titan, if you will, like a Ray Dalio. I read this quote from Nassim Taleb. Um, it must have been a couple of weeks ago, but he uh, has a tendency to tangle with journalists. He's not a big fan of that that field of work. Um, he was doing an interview and he made a statement. How many trades do you think I've placed in my life? And the interviewer said, I don't know. And Taleb said about 700,000. How many do you think I've won on in my life? Or how many do you think I've lost on out of those 700,000? And Taleb says probably about 695,000. <laughs> and so I was doing the math, you know, because Nassim Taleb is not a man for hyperbole. And I was doing the math and that comes out to like 400 trades a day which is a lot, it's way more than I do. But, um, you know, for, for his style, where he's basically looking for these, what he calls fat tail risks, you know, he's basically just looking for one trade that's gonna pay, you know, for thousands of losers. Um, but, you know, think of it like that, right? Stops are a necessary part of the process and you're gonna fail on these things. And it's not even necessarily you failing as much as it is the market just doing something that you weren't expecting. And you know the, the reality of it is, is you're never gonna be able to completely know what to expect in a market. And that's what makes it fun. That's what makes it um, possible to profit from. Because if this was easy, everybody would do it and nobody would work. Everybody just sit at home and guess what the euro dollar is gonna do and, you know, and laugh all the way to the bank, but it's not easy. It is difficult and analysis doesn't work all the time and there is no surefire strategy or always winning things. So if you want to get that edge, you've got to figure out a way to produce that edge. Now, seeing Taleb's edge, playing the law of numbers and then looking for risks that people wanted to ignore that he felt were underpriced so that when they did price in to market, then he could make a very handsome profit off of that. Nassim Taleb. <laughs> LDHF Pete, good to see you, my friend. Uh, like it, a lot of folks on Swissy, a lot of folks on Swissy. Uh, Robbie Hill says, uh, I think the US dollar is going to break uh, and head south because I think the US dollar is going to pull back for the next month or two. It, it is quite possible. It is quite possible. You know, we're, we're looking at a pretty climactic summer here, it appears. Um, you know, Trump keeps the headlines busy, you know, he keeps those headlines busy. Uh, from Jeremy Vanderstage. Yeah, finally got an image. Good to hear you and look at the character. Oh, nice. All right. Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, from Quran, some good retail data today. Cable, maybe not enough to give it fuel to go up, though. Uh, he who must not be mentioned by name is speaking this afternoon also. Yeah, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mark Carney. Um, yeah, you know, I think that these near-term data points right now, I don't want to say that they're discounted, but unless we get a big beat or, you know, a, a, a big miss, I think that, you know, kind of, kind of, 
median line expectation data is, is, is not going to elicit too much of a response here. I think the bigger push point is BOE policy and, and that's coming right from inflation. You know, so yeah, sure, retail data can feed into inflation, but again, unless we get like a really big beat or really big miss, I don't think that we're going to get much follow through there. Um, right now, the first and foremost thing for me around the UK is inflation data. And then after that, it's the way that the BOE is going to respond to that inflation data. Because it really does seem as though they've had a bias where you know they want to ignore strong inflation they want to focus on weak inflation all in the effort of keeping monetary policy really very dovish and it 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 does seem as though they've been contradictory at times on on multiple occasions actually um you know so that for me is where the push point is and it's put in a big run really fast i mean this is more than a thousand pips in a little over a month you know on a major currency pair so you know, as they say, motion creates emotion, right? And so I think that something like this, you know, it could help feed into inflation data in the second half of this year. And then that might be something the BOE has to contend with, inflation moving back towards 3%. But for right now, it doesn't appear to be as big of a concern. Not just yet, at least. All right, got a lot of questions, so I'm just trying to filter through here, folks. I'm trying to get a little bit for everyone. Uh, from man Pete, we need to have at least a two one for that Euro Yen setup. Might have to pass with all the Yen strength lately. That's totally understandable. Uh, you know, that's kind of what, I, and, and I think this is a good, this is a good kind of learning point, right? Because when I see something like this, uh, let's let's use that that euro yen move. When I see something like this, right, or like off a 15 minute chart, something like this, where it's like a new thing happening, a new thing getting priced in, I get a lot less excited about a setup, um, and and I'll straight up say it, a, a bit more. I hate using the word afraid, but a bit more skeptical, trepidatious, if you will. And the reason is because we have a relatively new reality. Something got priced in there. We don't have that pre-existing technical structure to work with. If I am going to look for this, I'm basically looking for new things to keep happening, right? And so it 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 is paradoxical to a degree. And I hate using the G word, but when we get that new thing happening or that new theme getting priced in or that new paradigm that is driving price action, that to me makes the setup a bit more of a gamble, there's a G word, than what I like to look for. If I have prior or pre-existing technical structure, I at the very least know where to place my stops and limits. I have a bit more confidence that we're going to hold. If, in fact, we do get a retest or uh, if we do get a retracement in that move, it, it just makes my life a lot more simple. A lot easier to compartmentalize and a lot easier to focus on that one set and what I should be doing. But, you know, it's it's kind of like this, like if we look at that uh, Turkish Lira run, right? I saw like so many people talking about this yesterday. Everybody's all excited about the Lira all of a sudden um, because they had that, yeah, it was like a, was a 650 basis point rate hike or 350 basis point rate hike. I can't trade this. It's, it doesn't fit my personal constitution. I have nothing to do here. It's fun to watch, but I watch in the same way that I watch a baseball game or a football game where it's just pretty much for entertainment matters only. Um, now, I know that a lot of folks aren't like that. You know, they see that something's moving and they, they really want to get a piece of it. Um, you know, I've just been in too many of those situations where, you know, I sold the low and then had this thing rip in my face and then I got to figure out what to do with it. And before you know it, a short term decision that took me five minutes to to, 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 to make is now a longer term problem that's taken me five days to deal with. Um, if at all, I want my mistakes to be five minutes long and I want my wins to be, you know, five days. I don't want that to be the other way around. So, uh, so yeah, I'm not, not so good with the, the new paradigm type of stuff. If it were up to me, everything would just stay the same all the time. I mean, not really, but, you know, relatively speaking, of course. Uh, William O'Keefe, um, 
I'm looking at market scope 2.0 platform, 12,000 on the US dollar chart weekly. I believe that's the Dow Jones FXEM dollar index, um, which I don't really follow anymore. Ever since uh, FXEM sold us, um, I haven't really stayed up with, with, with that market. You know, it is a little bit different, right? Because it does have a, uh, a different balance than what we're looking at in DXY. DXY has a, has a heavier European balance. Uh, U.S. dollar index or the Dow Jones FXM dollar index, the, the, the one that's on market scope 2.0, uh, that has uh, an allocation into Aussie. So it basically gets a China proxy in there as well. But yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with what's going on with uh, the 12K level there right now. Uh, is that Seculators? are saying a pullback and further downside to your dollar. We'll see how it's going to play out. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things, man. If they already knew, it would already be down, you know what I mean? Um, and, and that's cool. But I, I don't have any framework to suggest that it's immediately going down either. You know, I, there was a lot of folks who were saying that back in August, back in October, back in November, back in December. And maybe it does, but, you know, I, I think – just the cynical trader in me looks at something that's happened, you know, four or five times or four or five instances. And if it's happening again, I'm, you know, I have a tendency to think that it's probably going to replicate itself until it doesn't, you know. And, you know, I know there's a lot of folks that like the prediction game, and that's cool. It's just not my bag of tea. I look for angles so that I could risk a dollar to try to make two and then uh, wash, rinse, and repeat, try to keep it simple. Things been going down. There's a reason it might go down uh, or continue going down. There's also a reason why it might bounce. If I do it right, I could trade both of those. You know, I don't have to stick my, you know, my personal bias, or my point of view on, oh, the euro has to go up because it is supported. The euro has to go down because it is. I don't care. It goes up, it goes down. I want something to work with on either side of it. You know what I mean? And that's and that's that's kind of where I'm at on euro right now. Um, motion creates motion. I need this thing to show me some motion first, and then I could then I could start to work with it a little bit more. Uh, for Quran, oh, I don't that one was a little earlier. Uh, Nicholas Caboni, dollar czar after interest rate for czar. So this is not one that I follow much. Let me see if I can get anything off of this. Maybe I even have one of my old charts. Nope. Yeah, give me a quick second. We could do this on the fly. Yeah, I mean, it's at staging ground right now. It has to hold this little swing of support that was that swing low before I'd be able to look for reversal sets. Other than that, I'd probably be looking for resistance off of 12 spot 47 and a half up to 12 spot 48, you know, something like that. Basically trying to play this right down for a deeper break. But, you know, we're at that support right now. So if this thing wedges back up, that's when that set becomes a little bit more interesting. Um, I, I'm going to apologize in advance. On the fundamental side, I don't have anything great on, on dollars are right now. Um, I was following the situation up until the Ciro Ramaphosa election. There was some good volatility in the pair then. Uh, since I've been following other areas, uh, a lot of what's going on with this North Korea deal, etc., but yeah, there was a good move in there when Zuma was getting ousted. Since then, it's a little more difficult to work with. Uh, Jimmy Vanderstage, uh, Kiwi Dollar, in my opinion, has a couple of days, weeks in consolidation. We'd like to see a dip towards the low area of the zone and a strong lift off the 70 in the move. I like where you're looking. Um, now, my dream scenario in here dream scenario it's maybe a bit of a stretch my dream scenario probably wouldn't have to do with a currency pair but uh, <laughs> so i think the best thing that can happen here the best thing that can roll out 
is we get a really nasty day. You know, maybe it's one of these, you know, trade war days or something. But I want to see that get pierced briefly right through there. I want to get folks thinking that that range is broken. I wanted to take out those stops, clear out that sentiment. And I want folks, uh, I, I want to see these these folks head spin. That's when I think this gets really attractive for a long. Break the lows and then pull right back, right? I think that's where this thing could get really attractive for a long setup. You know, because right now I, I have to imagine there's a lot of folks doing the same thing that I'm doing. You know, just looking to basically bury into this range and 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 and, and look for this thing to move back up. You know, it's 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 almost too clear for me right now. Um, it's so clear that it feels like I said a little earlier, a little bit trappish. So you know, if we got that quick head fake, that break or that quick breach below support. I think that is, is what can make this really attractive. You know, so if we're calling this low at 67.82, I'd be looking for a move to like 67.75, just a slight breach, just enough to take out any stops that might be placed like right at that level or right around it. Um, from Karan Dow, what if it breaks 24.888, still await 25? Let me, let me look back, get a little bit of structure here. Yeah, yeah, I, I wouldn't be looking to do a bullish breakout from 24.888 up to 25. Uh, at this point, this would be a lower low for me, or excuse me, a, a lower high. And we just came down to a lower low. So, you know, shorter term, this does have the possibility of a continuation of bearish structure. I wouldn't be looking to play breakouts from there. Uh, from Munir, uh, how do you force yourself to stay in a profitable trade when there's a pullback? Stops. Set my stops at good levels, plan my exits, and let the plan take care of itself. I mean, there's a couple ways of answering this question. You know, if if um, if it's one more of discipline, it, it, and then it's the only way that I know to force discipline on myself is to force myself to do something until I see the logic of it. You know, it, it, it's like that with anything in my life where I've had to be disciplined, you know, whether it's managing a winning trade or, you know, staying in the gym. I have to see the benefits and the drawbacks of doing it versus not doing it, just my own life. So that when I wake up in the morning, it's like, wait a minute, I really don't want to work out today. But you know what? These are all the reasons that I need to go to the gym, you know, something like that. And then now, you know, this type of stuff is easy for me because it, it, like I actually want to do it. The benefits outweigh the the, the, the drawbacks. When it comes to managing a winning trade or uh, managing a winning trade that's pulling back against you, I think over the long term, if you get enough of those scenarios where you A, cut it too quick, right? So you have, say, a trailed stop or a break-even stop, and then something retraces, you, you think it's going to take you out, and so you just jump it, and you take it out quick. And then prices rally in your direction, so you left a lot of profit on the table. I think, uh, you know, if you have enough of those scenarios where you see where your action or your jumpiness or your reaction cost you, that's something that will have a tendency to teach you uh, uh, in the direction that you want. Uh, have a tendency to reinforce discipline. Um, the idea of self-control is highly overrated. You know, I think as humans, we have a tendency to want to naturally just have this, you know, very disciplined, stoic way of going about things. And, you know, I, I think that you have to, especially at first, you know, you kind of have to force yourself to take baby steps until you do eventually see the benefit of of, of doing that type of stuff. So, like, again, I, I made the statement self-control is overrated. Um, you know, so one thing I'm trying to do right now is drink less caffeine. Right. And so and I've been trying to do this for like the past three months or something. And so I'd come into the office. Normally, I'd have a few cups of coffee or whatever. And, you know, at first when I was just like, hey, yeah, I want to drink less caffeine. You know, I would I would I would sit there and I would like negotiate with myself. OK, well, yeah, maybe you shouldn't have a third cup today. But in actuality, I wanted it. You know, so I was talking to my wife about it. She's like, dude, you're being stupid. Just take some green tea or something. Replace your second cup of coffee with green tea and you can just drink green tea the rest of the day. Boom. Your loss has become a gain, you know, so that that's what I did. And then lo and behold, cutting back the coffee consumption, not too difficult. 
But uh, it was only because I kind of pre-programmed my own failure of self-control so that I didn't even have to worry about it. Um, where you can make this relevant with trading is you could use trailed stops as in, uh, so like the dollar yen setup that I was in, I think that might be where, where, what uh, generated your initial question. You could use trailed stops, right? So as this thing was building, got all these higher highs and higher lows to work with, I could simply look to adjust my stop up to protect a portion of the additional profits that I have on that continuation move. So that ultimately if this thing does break down and break out, at least I've taken some off of that last remaining lot. Uh, oh, another thing, and, and I don't know if I mentioned this because uh, we were talking about another aspect of it, but scaling out on the way up helps me a lot too, because I don't feel like, you know, I don't have that impending doom of, oh man, if I don't close it now, I'm not going to be able to take any of this profit out. No, I pre-programmed myself where I want to exit on the way up. And then when it pulls back, if it pulls back, at least I paid myself for my work so far. Hopefully that helps. Uh, Karan asking, have you traded Turkish Lira moves? I have not. No, I haven't touched it. <laughs> um, good question here, and, and I apologize. Uh, what's the meaning of LDHF, by the way? Sorry for my ignorance, but I Googled and couldn't find the meaning of the acronym. So there was actually a time when it was Google searchable. Um, it's uh, it, it's just a colloquialism we have here in the, uh, in the, in the Daily Effects webinars. It started... Probably like six years ago now, I would do these scalping webinars, and they're basically like two hours long, and uh, it stands for long distance high five. It's how we'd congratulate each other on those on those deals. Um, but the colloquialism stuck around, and that's where it comes from. Whenever you hear LDHF, it's from uh, one of those folks that was with me back on those scalping webinars way back in the day. Uh, from Quran, it's good to be open to change. It's what you chaps are teaching me. It's uh, amazing the number of life lessons I've learned through trading in markets. Uh, discipline, that's definitely one of them that's up there. Being open-minded is probably the biggest one because if you're not open-minded in a market, it costs you. And you can't be closed-minded and wrong for long or else you're not going to be trading for long. And, you know, that's just kind of the way that it cuts. You know, it's a very, very complex world out there. And markets have taught me that I have far more questions than answers. And so it does allow me to look at things, I think, a bit more um, genuinely, rather than going into it with a predetermined outlook. But uh, in markets, you got to be able to change. You got to be able to flip. You got to be able to. Uh, you got to be able to trade, even your own points of views. <laughs> Leo Key says you do things that you don't want to, but after you know it was the right thing to do. Uh, yeah, you know, it's it's um, if you force yourself to do it for long enough, you don't even ha you don't even have that, you know, before after dichotomy any longer. You know, you know before that you're doing what you're supposed to do and 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 you are directing yourself at that point. That's the essence of discipline when you're forcing yourself on a path. It's uh, it's pretty cool. But I couldn't really do it until I was like probably like 30 or so, you know, where I could really just force myself to shut down the animal side of my brain. It was saying, no, oh, I don't want to work out or oh, I don't want to I don't want to eat healthy, you know. Or, oh, I don't want to go to sleep. You know, it took me until I was about 30 where I was like, dude, you are an idiot. You cause problems. So I'm just not going to listen to you and I'm going to do what I know exactly I should do. Alejandro Ruiz, yes, I was one of those listeners, LDHF, I do it now with my boys, that's awesome, spreading the love, LDHF, I think I'm going to have to call my dad afterwards, give him an LDHF down in Texas, <laughs> um, 
Manier says, I have the same problem with caffeine addiction, by the way. Best of luck. Got to go slow. Slowly, slowly go with a little bit less, a little bit less, a little bit less. Before you know it, you made a big impact and you didn't even really feel it. Uh, Robbie Hill says, I think Kiwi Dollar is going to break lower out of the range it's in. That's cool, too. That could lead to some decent downside run. You know, the thing is, if it does do that, if we do have that, you know, that legitimate run of dollar strength, you know, the question I have after that is, is Kiwi Dollar really the best place to be? I don't know. I think in that scenario where we have a surging dollar that does cause us to break out of that multi-year range, I think I'm going to be want to be short euro dollar, short pound dollar, something like that. No, I, I have a difficult time expecting new something new to happen when you know something's been going on for like two years. So at this point, I would just have to stick to the range until it breaks. I'm not saying that it won't break. Just saying until it does. That's what I'm looking for. Um, all right, got to take the last question of the day. Uh, my man Pete, I like that 145, uh, 146.65 level for Rainer and Gepi. Uh, please take a look at Pound Aussie. I will be happy to, my friend. Pound Oz. Pound Oz has seen better days, seen better weeks. Pretty nasty weekly bar there. I had one of these setups that was looking very clean. Oh, yeah, this was the one. You know, I got the same kind of fear here that I had on, uh, that I have on, on cable. You know, the more I look at it, the more it's... You know, it's one of those things where it's uh, it's it's kind of like cable in October of last year after the flash crash. It's like, yeah, sure, we're bearish, but who's going to come in and sell it, you know? Um, yeah, I would need that thing to wiggle back before I'd be able to do anything short on it just yet. Love the trend, hate the price. Prior swing lows of the way of 79.10, so we got like 240 away. Yeah, it's just a little too dicey right now. You know, uh, encouraging that we have a short side break below that fib or that uh, 50 retracement. But, yeah, I just don't have anything good here, my friend. Not yet. Now, that level's legit right in here, 79. I say it's legit because we had this, uh, we had two little swings right down there, and then we gapped through it this weekend. We filled that gap. And then we jutted right back down. But, you know, that's the level that just really sticks out to me, 79. If we pulled a little bit deeper towards that, I'd be open to uh, taking on some short side. Yeah, I mean, it even has, like, options for where I could place my stop, 80 and a half or above 80, 115. Yeah, love the trend, hate the price. I needed to pop back to where this prior gap was or towards where that prior gap was so that I could set it up a little bit more proficiently. Uh, but that, my friends, is what I have for today. just want to say thank you very much to everybody for your time, uh, for all your fantastic questions. Uh, I'm going to be back next week, Tuesday and Thursday. Like I said, we have a ton of USD data, so we're likely going to be looking at the dollar from a few different vantage points. But uh, again, just want to say thank you so much, everybody, for your time. I hope you have a fantastic rest of the day. And as always, happy trading. Ladies and gentlemen.